Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Start Local, a podcast focused on helping small businesses in Chester County and the greater Philly area as we navigate through this COVID-19 economy. My name's Joe Casabona, and I am here with my fellow co-host, Liam Dempsey. Liam, how are you? Joe, I'm trying to sound very enthusiastic because I was listening to the episode that we launched today and you were super enthusiastic and I was kind of deadpan. Uh So I'm trying to be super (laughs) enthusiastic. I'm really excited to be here today. Well, I'm happy to, I have never questioned your enthusiasm, Liam. Uh, I am just a loud New York Italian. (laughs) Awesome. And before we bring in our guests, who I'm very excited to talk about today, I want to tell you about the Start Local monthly newsletter. If you go to Start Local, dot co slash news you can sign up for our very free very monthly newsletter where you will get takeaways from every episode tips and tricks for navigating through the covid19 economy and you will get some news around the county and around pennsylvania in general so sign up it's totally free uh that's again over at startlocal.co slash news and with that i want to bring in our guests they are gareth yoder and Joy Beam, the CEO and production manager, respectively, of Cedar Meadow Meats. How are you both doing today? Doing well, Joe. How about yourself? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. And Joy, how are you? I'm doing great. And yeah, we appreciate you guys having us on today. It's a pleasure. Our, uh, the pleasure is all ours, because let me tell you, I am uh, not good at anything that doesn't involve a computer. So I am always excited <laughs> to uh, talk to people who like work in the real world. Uh, so with that, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, what exactly Cedar Meadow Meats is? Sure. So I'll start off. So my name, of course, is Joy Beam, and I've grown up on my family's farm. I currently work off the farm. Um, on a day job, but then raise cattle on the side. It's a my side hobby. I also call it my walking bank account. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's been a lot of fun and been learning a lot. And I say my passion is cattle and providing wholesome quality product for for the market and the end consumer. Fantastic. And Gareth? Yeah. So I work in the tech industry. I work for a financial company as a technical lead. And when I'm not in front of the computer, I enjoy being outside and, and, and getting exercise and enjoying the nice days. Nice. Very nice. And so Joy, this is your family's farm. Uh, And is this the kind of main business I was reading on your about page that uh, it's been in your family since the fifties ish? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So my grandpa started the farm actually uh, way back in the 50s. He brought hogs and cattle on here. And then my dad took over in like the 1990s. And then so me and my siblings would be the third generation. Um, All of us are working away from the farm right now, but we all hope to someday be involved back on the home operation. But yeah, it is the primary source of income for my parents and then two other families involved as well. Um, and it's our passion and, and our, our lifestyle. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and before I throw it over to Liam, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, so we have the farm and then we have uh, Cedar Meadow Meats, which is kind of, and, and a, an interesting business aspect that we're going to be talking about today, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Cedar Meadow Meats is the retail outlet of our family's farm, which is called Cedar Meadow Swine. And we developed, we started Cedar Meadow Meats um, just this year, back in the spring before COVID hit. Um, So we're excited about that. We're currently retailing beef through there, but then also we'll be adding on pork for this next year. Nice. That is fantastic. And before we get to real questions about the business, I have to ask, are there any cedars cedars near the meadow or is that just a nice name? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, great question. Yeah. So actually the name comes from, because we did used to have a cedar meadow and back when we kept our hogs outside, uh, we actually used to keep our sows, our mama pigs out in the cedar meadow. Um, Since then, our production system has kind of evolved. So we've found that hogs do better inside. um, So they're not outside 
typically anymore. Um, but yeah, we did used to have hogs on our cedar meadow. And there you have it, folks. Now we know the story. So <laughs> before we hit record, we were talking about the the backstory for Cedar Meadow Meats and how that came about. And it was really tech, a technology goal in AIM that the two of you had around the business. Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah, I, I can start off. So last summer into last fall, we developed or we our goal was to try to predict the health of cattle based on real-time sensor collection. And so we had this idea that, that we can use sensors to help predict the cattle's health through tracking their activity and their movements, and then running that through an algorithm to try to determine if they're exhibiting uh, signs that they may need treated for a potential sickness. And we started off, we had this idea, and we actually, to gather our data, we strapped a smartphone around the neck of one of the steers and then video record recorded their movements. And I was able to get their, their activity recognition through the algorithm to around 85%. And that's when we figured, oh, we might actually have something. And so we started... We created a business plan. Uh, we worked with Penn State Berks' test lab and did some client, got some grant money for a client discovery for this product. And leading up to uh, our client discovery event, which was the National Cattlemen's Association, um, the NCBA uh, event in the beginning of February, we started taking a deeper dive and, and looking at the hardware pieces that were involved and a deeper dive into the software. And we realized we, the hardware pieces for the startup costs would be quite substantial um, and would have taken a lot of time and resources that we really didn't have. And then when we were down at the National Cattlemen's uh, and Beef Association in San Antonio in the beginning of February, they we saw some other competitors there that had some infinite resources in developing this technology out. And we were listening to one of the seminars and the speaker said, people and consumers nowadays want to know where their food comes from. They want to know that their food is coming locally. And that, you know, spawned an idea and kind of led us to pivot away from the technical aspect to more now of a retail beef outlet. And so I had the technical sales, so I quickly built a website around this. And the end of February, beginning of March, is when we actually launched our website and kind of launched our company. That's fantastic. And so I love like a bunch of things about that story. Uh, but first, um, you know, I have a master's degree in software engineering. And one of the things that we talked about that like totally blew my mind, I never thought about it. And this was back in like, the late 2000s um, was that cattle and a lot of, of, of farm animals have sensors or tags, right? Where like you, you can kind of see their path. How different were the sensors that you needed from the tags that kind of had been on uh, uh, cattle for some amount of time? Yeah, so the traditional tags are typically RFID tags, which is more or less just uh, as they would walk through an RFID sensor, it would mm. record their number. The tags that we were using were, were sensors that had the accelerometer and a gyroscope in them. And then we would have to stream that data into the cloud then to do our data processing. Gotcha. So you would essentially need like, like almost like a mini smartphone attached Correct. to. Yep. Uh, and that was, that was one of the core hardware issues around keeping this idea from going deeper into it, gotcha. pursuing it farther. Gotcha. And I'll add in two here. I'll say agriculture as a whole is really looking at how we can implement technology into management of livestock for more efficient and more accurate uh, management so that we can maybe treat earlier, but then use fewer antibiotics and maybe um, really cut down on some of some of those usages there. And I know the dairy industry has been using some some kind of form of this um, 
to both detect heat, so you can be a little bit better with your breeding accuracy, um, and then, yeah, detecting sickness there too. So we were hoping to come in more from the beef market angle, but also produce a product that would be cheaper than what's currently on the market. Um, but obviously we saw that there's actually several other big players looking at the same thing right now. And um, of course they have a lot of resources available to them that we don't have. So. So while I want to ask if you were able to determine which one of the steers was the fastest from the metrics <laughs> that you were, I'm going to ask you actually about pivoting your business. So the, the technological approach that you had wanted to take about health management through data collection and devices was was maybe a bridge too far or one that you weren't willing to to go down. So you decided to pivot to uh, customer-based, uh, direct-to-customer sales of beef. Talk about that because you, we, we talked beforehand about how folks are increasingly interested in knowing where their food comes from and, and how the animals were cared for and raised and treated. Uh, but then you still had to sell it. You had to let people know we have steer available we can properly butcher them and prepare them so that you can take them home and eat them talk to us about that what was life that like um in february and march as you pivoted (laughs) yeah so we pivoted and then of course gareth did an awesome job developing our website and then yeah the goal was to get our name out there we had several steers booked with a butcher for may so that means we had product to get names on and move. And the other interesting thing about selling halves, holes, and quarters of beef is if you only sell half the animal, of course you can't only butcher half the animal. <laughs> so you gotta be able to sell in whole steer quantities and uh, match up customer orders to fit whole steers there. Um, so I guess we started where any new business would start. Um, of course, the free marketing tools available, which would be probably number one, Facebook. So we made a little video describing the business that we started and what we had available. And um, and then local word of mouth. So we sold the first quarter to somebody who knew us. Um, I, I think who knew my dad through the township or something. And then, of course, we had the remaining three quarters we had to move. And that was a little bit of a tougher sale. Um, thankfully, one of our friends needed was able to move some with her mom. And they were able to take our first year that way. And, um, so that was the first year and then COVID hit and, um, I'll let you decide what, what road you want to go down with COVID in mind. But, um, I, I'd say the story kind of flipped when that hit. Yeah. So, talk about that. Yeah. Go ahead, Gareth. I cut you off. So Joy, Joy created a sign and, and she has quite a bit of traffic out the end of her, her road and, and, you know, big, big four letters, beef, and then with a phone number underneath and, as the price in the store was skyrocketing and on the news, you heard this, the labor shortages at the processing plant. A simple, simple sign did a world of a difference just to get people um, calling us and getting that interest. And then we would point people to the website. And that's where we started com- trying to communicate our story of this is local beef from Chester County. That's yeah, I a- think that's... Oh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, I was going to say, uh, that's that's incredible. And something that we've heard uh, regularly on this show from other uh, guests is, you know, people called and then you pointed them to the website. Uh, were you doing anything to capture any of that information up front or was it when they placed orders? Like what, what, what did that kind of look like? Yeah, so as far as capturing the information, when somebody called, we kept track of their phone number and how they heard about us and what their interest was. Uh, we also tried to take notes on like if they had bought and also bulk freezer beef before or if they'd be a new customer to this kind of, I'll call it an arena. Um, because, yeah, there are some different, you have to kind of know um, kind of how the process works, which is easy to explain, but... Um, then we knew kind of where to start with the process. But yeah, for sure, trying to collect as much information as we could. Um, and I'd say that's one thing we're trying to improve on for the coming year. Yeah, I just want to ask a little bit more specifics on that because we we do have listeners and an audience who may be trying to apply some of the lessons that you and Gareth Joy are, are 
leading on here. Is that a Google Doc? Do you have a CRM? Is it a paper notebook that you pass between the two of you? Mm-hmm. How are you recording this data in a way that will enable you to actually use it for the upcoming email campaign or updating the stories on your website or thinking about what video do we need to shoot and what story do we need to tell? Yeah, so we are using a Google Docs right now, um, which is which is great. And for right now, it's working well for us. Um, of course, there's only two of us involved in the company. And um, so it's easy to communicate and we communicate with texting on the side. Um, so yeah, we, we have a page for our 2020 product. And then the product we hope to move in 2021, along with customers that have already placed orders for 2021. And then, yeah, we keep track on there, what money has come in. Uh, of course, check numbers and all of that good stuff. And um, yeah, and then we'll call on the phone and be able to pull that sheet right up and discuss it and change things on there as, as we talk and go from there. So that's what I'm told that's been working very well for us um, in our current state of business. That's fantastic. And let's talk a little bit about the business side of things. So you're, you're selling beef that's coming from Joy's Farm. Mm-hmm. How, are, how are folks paying for that? I, I didn't get a chance to go through the process myself. I'm very interested in learning more. Is this, is, is your site e-commerce, Garrett? Did you make an e-commerce site? Are you doing over the phone sales? How does it work? Again, thinking about other businesses that may be yep. interested in pivoting, what is what does your payment process look like? So for right now, we tried to avoid credit cards, mainly to avoid that fee and, and it just helps keep our, our prices lower. So we were accepting uh, Venmo, PayPal, and, or check by the mail. And then if they were local, like if they drove past and saw the sign, they were more than welcome to just drop off either the check or cash uh, to Joy. Uh, looking at the future, we, we may consider adding that e-commerce section for us, it was, let's quickly just get something out there first this year, and then we can start collecting feedback. We plan to have like a follow-up thank you email and kind of a quick survey to all of our customers that, that bought from us this summer, just asking, you know, what went well through, through the process, through uh, was everything clear and, and concise? Did it meet your expectations? And then offering, you know, asking for feedback. If there's be something that you would improve upon, what would that be? And so take, we'll take a look at that over the course of this winter, and then we'll be able to kind of enhance our business for yeah, I like that. Wh- whatever the customer is asking for. Yeah, so you're iterating. You're, let's, we have three quarters of a cow. There I said it. I knew it was <laughs> of a steer to sell that, that we have to do that. So let's talk about Venmo and PayPal. Are those business mm-hmm. accounts for you folks, or is that going into you know one of your accounts and you're running it through uh, that way? How does that work? Again, thinking about examples for for others to follow. Yeah. So right now we have a PayPal that's linked up with with my business email, and then the Venmo for right now is is a personal Venmo. Uh, we look at this fall is when we're going to really kind of circle back around and get some of the formalities of, of this business in place. So we definitely, we kind of did it as, as a trial for the summer to see how it actually goes. And it kind of, it surpassed our expectations. And so that's when we kind of have to loop back around and say, Oh, let's, let's get a more official in, in a couple of these areas. Yeah. So I'll add on to that as well. So currently if a customer makes out a check, um, they make it out to either myself, Joy Beam, or Gareth Uter. And that's been a point that's been a little bit misleading. Um, we've had probably not too many, but we've had a few customers who make out a check to the actual Cedar Meadow Meats. And that's not set up. We don't have a bank account associated with that right now. Um, so that's one thing we're hoping to do over maybe our off-selling season um, to really get us set up next year and make it easier for customers to use. Awesome. I, I love that, right? Because there, there's a really good lesson here in that um, you don't need, it doesn't need to be like the exact process you envisioned in the beginning, right? You can iterate. You got, you pivoted quickly from the idea, which I think is amazing because I think a lot of people would just be like, well, I'll just go back to my regular job then. Um, so you you pivoted quickly, you set up a web a website quickly, and now you're thinking about how to improve that process. Uh, so you mentioned the fall. Is summer a busy season for you? I know nothing about 
<laughs> really anything outside of computers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I'd say traditionally grilling season is when people really start to think about meat. So probably your May, June, early July sales are your strongest. And um, that's kind of what we thought too. But then we also had people wanting some beef in September, maybe not as high of a demand, but definitely some people there. And then we have people already booked out through this December and then next May. Um, and then, yeah, so, and then we also have some freezer hogs available for the fall and spring um, for people looking for more immediate meat to fill the freezer. Nice. Do you see like an increase for like, uh, like Christmas ham or something like that? Like in the, we yeah. hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so. But um, yeah, so we're, we're hoping to kind of use Christmas as, I guess, a marketing strategy um, because I would think filling a family member's freezer with beef would be a really cool um, Christmas package, especially a quarter. It takes about, I think, five square feet um, to fit a beef into a freezer. So if you have five square feet of freezer, you can do it that way or even divide between family members. But um, yeah, it's some premium steak for Christmas sounds pretty good to me anyway. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Awesome Christmas yeah. And I love the way that you're, you're, you're packaging it, right? Because I mean, we, we see a cow or a steer in the field and, you know, there's a 1,500 or a 2,000 pound animal. That's not getting in my freezer anytime soon. But what does it look like when it comes butchered and packaged in five square feet? Well, that I can figure out, and I'm no parts mathematician. So that's that's really helpful. And I guess that goes back to that storytelling that that, that Gareth was talking about and the data that you're trying to get from folks who are inquiring of your business and inquiring of your products and, and learning from what's their education standpoint? What's their background? What do they know about this? Because, yeah, it's one thing to pop into – to Whole Foods or to Giant and to Acme and to buy a nice steak, but it's quite another to go pick up 120 pounds of butchered <laughs> beef from a farm in, in Chester County. So that's really interesting to think about how you're translating for the folks who are who are new to the marketplace. Yeah, and I'll actually add one comment on here, but one misconception probably, I mean, that consumers have that I, I didn't realize until two years ago is actually, so... The United States is known for premium beef throughout the world. We're known as the highest quality beef, but actually all of our choice and prime steaks, which would be the the highest quality steaks produced, those are all sold on the overseas market. Um, So you will not find those on the local grocery store shelf. I, I expect some restaurants would have them, but can't guarantee they're all there. So sometimes the only way to really get that premium steak is to buy it direct from the farmer. Um, or at least really know where you're getting that steak from. Look at us, Joe. We're breaking cattle news right here yeah, on the right, yeah. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I know I learned a lot and yeah, I, I just love your story. It's fantastic. Um, if people want to get some meat or mm-hmm. uh, want to learn more about you and your story, where can people find you? Yeah, I'd say go ahead, check out our website, www.cedarmeadowmeats.com. And on there, you'll see a couple pictures about uh, about who we are, about you know, the cattle that we raise, and then some of the benefits of beef. And you can see our, our, our prices, of course. And you can choose if you want a quarter steer, a half steer, or a whole steer. And the and the kind of the nice thing is, is that you don't have to make that commitment for a whole steer. So we can, we link up four different people that don't even know each other that all could get a quarter. Uh, and for the size that it, it really works out nice. Yeah. yeah. And then of course, customers get to choose their custom cutting instructions. So um, I'm a huge fan of inch cut steaks compared to three quarter inch cut steaks. Cause they really hold the juice in there better. And um they, they grow up really nicely. I'm going to remember that point specifically. <laughs> All right. So you, yep. <laughs> you will be able to find the link to Cedar Meadow Meats and more information in the show notes for this episode over at startlocal.co. Joy, Gareth, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so thanks much for having, having us. Thanks so much, yeah. folks. We'll chat with you soon. Yes. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Until next time, stay safe out there. <laughs>